Volume One, Letters Forty Nine through Fifty Four, of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brooke, Letters Forty Nine through Fifty Four, read by Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermor. Kit Nusis, as Edward Rivers. Letter forty nine. To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, January one. It is with difficulty I breathe, my dear. The cold is so amazingly intense as almost totally to stop respiration. I have business, the business of pleasure, at Quebec, but have not courage to stir from the stove. We have had five days, the severity of which none of the natives remember to have ever seen equalled. Tis said the cold is beyond all the thermometers here though intended for the climate. The strongest wine freezes in a room which has a stove in it. Even brandy is thickened to the consistence of oil. The largest wood-fire, in a wide chimney, does not throw out its heat a quarter of a yard. I must venture to Quebec to-morrow, or have company at home. Amusements are here necessary to life. We must be jovial, or the blood will freeze in our veins. I no longer wonder the elegant arts are unknown here. The rigour of the climate suspends the very powers of the understanding— what then must become of those of the imagination? Those who expect to see a new Athens rising near the pole will find themselves extremely disappointed. Genius will never mount high, where the faculties of the mind are benumbed half the year. Tis sufficient employment for the most lively spirit here to contrive how to preserve an existence, of which there are moments that one is hardly conscious. The cold really sometimes brings on a sort of stupefaction. We had a million of bows here yesterday, notwithstanding the severe cold. Tis the Canadian custom— calculated i suppose for the climate to visit all the ladies on new year's day who sit dressed in form to be kissed i assure you however our kisses could not warm them but we were obliged to our eternal disgrace to call in raspberry brandy as an auxiliary you would have dined to see the men they looked just like so many bears in their open carrioles all wrapped in furs from head to foot you see nothing of the human form appear but the tip of a nose they have entire coats of beaver skin exactly like friday's and robinson crusoe and casks on their heads like the old knights errant in romance you never saw such tremendous figures but without this kind of clothing it would be impossible to stir out at present the ladies are equally covered up though in a less unbecoming style they have long cloth cloaks with loose hoods like those worn by the market women in the north of england i have one in scarlet the hood lined with sable the prettiest ever seen here in which i assure you i look amazingly handsome the men think so and call me the little red riding hood a name which becomes me as well as the hood the canadian ladies wear these cloaks in india silk in summer which fluttering in the wind look really graceful on a fine woman besides our riding hoods when we go out we have a large buffalo skin under our feet which turns up and wraps round us almost to our shoulders so that upon the whole we are pretty well guarded from the weather as well as the men our covered carriers too have not only canvas windows we dare not have glass because we often overturn but cloth curtains to draw all round us the extreme swiftness of these carriages also which dart along like lightning, helps to keep one warm, by promoting the circulation of the blood. I pity the fits. No tiger was ever so hard-hearted as I am this weather. The little god has taken his flight, like the swallows. I say nothing, but cruelty is no virtue in Canada, at least at this season. I suppose Pygmalion's statue was some frozen Canadian gentlewoman, and a sudden warm day thawed her. I love to expound ancient fables, and I think no exposition can be more natural than this— would you know what makes me chatter so this morning? Papa has made me take some excellent liqueur. Tis the mode here. All the Canadian ladies take a little, which makes them so coquette and agreeable. Certainly brandy makes a woman talk like an angel. Adieu. Yours. A. Fermor. Letter 50 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, January 4. I don't quite agree with you, my dear. Your brother does not appear to me to have the least scruple of that foolish false modesty which stands in a man's way. He is extremely what the French call awakened. He is modest, certainly. That is, he is not a coxcomb, but he has all that proper self-confidence which is necessary to set his agreeable qualities in full light. Nothing can be a stronger proof of this than that, wherever he is, he always takes your attention in a moment, and this without seeming to solicit it. I am very fond of him, though he never makes love to me, in which circumstance he is very singular. Our friendship is quite platonic, at least on his side, for I'm not quite so sure on the other. 
I remember one day in summer we were walking tete-a-tete -tete in the road to Cape Rouge when he wanted me to strike into a very beautiful thicket. "'Positively, Rivers,' said I, "'I will not venture with you into that wood. Are you afraid of me, Belle? No, but extremely of myself. I have loved him ever since a little scene that passed here, three or four months ago, a very affecting story, of a distressed family in our neighbourhood, was told him and Sir George.' The latter preserved all the philosophic dignity and manly composure of his countenance, very coldly expressed his concern, and called another subject. Your brother changed colour, his eyes glistened, he took the first opportunity to leave the room, he sought these poor people, he found, he relieved them, which we discovered by accident a month after. The weather, though cold beyond all that you have in England, can form an idea of, is yet mild, to what it has been the last five or six days. We are going to Quebec, to church. Two o'clock. Emily and I have been talking religion all the way home. We are both mighty good girls, as girls go in these degenerate days, our grandmothers to be sure, but it's folly to look back. We have been saying, Lucy, that tis the strangest thing in the world people should quarrel about religion, since we undoubtedly all mean the same thing. All good minds in every religion aim at pleasing the supreme being. The means we take differ according to the country where we are born, and the prejudices we imbibe from education— a consideration which ought to inspire us with kindness and indulgence to each other. If we examine each other's sentiments with candour, we shall find much less difference in essentials than we imagine, since all agree to own, at least to mean, one great, one good, one general lord of all. There is, I think, a very pretty Sunday reflection for you, Lucy. You must know I am extremely religious, and for this amongst other reasons, that I think infidelity a vice peculiarly contrary to the native softness of woman. It is bold, daring, masculine, and I should almost doubt the sex of an unbeliever in petticoats. Women are religious as they are virtuous, less from principles founded on reasoning and argument, than from elegance of mind, delicacy of moral taste, and a certain quick perception of the beautiful and becoming in every thing. This instinct, however, for such it is, is worth all the tedious reasonings of the men, which is a point I flatter myself you will not dispute with me. Monday, January 5. This is the first day I have ventured in an open carriole. We have been running a race on the snow, your brother and I against Emily and Fitzgerald. We conquered from Fitzgerald's complacence to Emily. I shall like it mightily, well wrapped up. I set off with a crape over my face to keep off the cold, but in three minutes it was a cake of solid ice, from my breath which froze upon it. Yet this is called a mild day, and the sun shines in all his glory. Sillery, Thursday, January 8, midnight. We are just come from the General's Assembly much company, and we dance till this minute, for I believe we have not been more coming these four miles. Fitzgerald is the very pink of courtesy. He never uses his covered carriole himself, but devotes it entirely to the ladies. It stands at the general's door and waiting on Thursdays. If any lady comes out before her carriole arrives, the servants call out mechanically, "'Captain Fitzgerald's carriole here for a lady.' The colonel is equally gallant, but I generally lay an embargo on his. They have each of them an extreme pretty one for themselves— or to drive a fair lady a morning's airing, when she will allow them the honour, and the weather is mild enough to permit it. Bonsoir. I am sleepy. Yours, A. Furmore. Letter 51. To John Temple, Esquire, Pall Mall, Quebec, January 9. You mistake me extremely, Jack, as you generally do. I have by no means forsworn marriage. On the contrary, though happiness is not so often found there as I wish it was, yet I am convinced it is to be found nowhere else. And, poor as I am, I should not hesitate about trying the experiment myself to-morrow, if I could meet with a woman to my taste, unappropriated, whose ideas of the state agreed with mine, which I allow are something out of the common road, but I must be certain those ideas are her own, therefore they must arise spontaneously, and not in complacence to mine, for which reason, if I could, I would endeavour to lead my mistress into the subject, and know her sentiments on the manner of living in that state before I discovered my own. I must also be well convinced of her tenderness before I make a declaration of mine. She must not distinguish me because I flatter her, but because she thinks I have merit. Those fancied passions, where gratified vanity assumes the form of love, will not satisfy my heart. The eyes, the air, the voice of the woman I love, a thousand little indiscretions dear to the heart, must convince me I am beloved, before I confess I love. Though sensible of the advantages of fortune, I can be happy without it. If I should ever be rich enough to live in the world, no one will enjoy it with greater gust. If not, I can, with great spirit, provided I find such a companion as I wish, retire from it to love, content, and a cottage. 
by which I mean to the life of a little country gentleman. You ask me of my opinion of the winter here. If you can bear a degree of cold, of which Europeans can form no idea, it is far from being unpleasant. We have settled frost and an eternal blue sky. Travelling in this country in winter is particularly agreeable. The carriages are easy, and go on the ice with an amazing velocity, though drawn only by one horse. The continual plain of snow would be extremely fatiguing both to the eye and imagination, were both not relieved, not only by the woods in prospect, but by the tall branches of pine with which the road is marked out on each side, and which form a verdant avenue agreeably contrasted with the dazzling whiteness of the snow, on which, when the sun shines, it is almost impossible to look steadily even for a moment. Were it not for this method of marking out the roads, it would be impossible to find the way from one village to another. The eternal sameness, however, of this avenue is tiresome when you go far in one road. I have passed the last two months in the most agreeable manner possible, in a little society of persons I extremely love. I feel myself so attached to this little circle of friends that I have no pleasure in any other company, and think all the time absolutely lost that politeness forces me to spend anywhere else. I extremely dread our parties being dissolved, and wish the winter to last for ever, for I am afraid the spring will divide us. Adieu, and believe me, yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 52 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, January 9 I begin not to disrelish the winter here. Now I am used to the cold. I don't feel it so much, as there is no business done here in the winter. Tis the season of general dissipation. Amusement is the study of everybody, and the pains people take to please themselves contribute to the general pleasure. Upon the whole, I am not sure it is not a pleasanter winter than that of England. Both our houses and our carriages are uncommonly warm. The clear, serene sky, the dry, pure air, the little parties of dancing and cards, the good tables we all keep, the driving about on the ice, the abundance of people we see there, for everybody has a carry-all, the variety of objects new to a European, keep the spirits in a continual agreeable hurry, that is difficult to describe, but very pleasant to feel. Sir George, would you believe it, has written Emily a very warm letter, tender, sentimental, and almost impatient, Mrs. Melmoth's dictating, I will answer for it, not at all in his own composed agreeable style. He talks of coming down in a few days. I have a strong notion he is coming, after his long, tedious two years' siege, to endeavour to take us by storm at last. He certainly prepares for a coup de main. He is right. All women hate a regular attack. Adieu for the present. Monday, January 12. We sat at your brother's to-night, with the Beaumont of Quebec. We shall be superbly entertained, I know. I am malicious enough to wish Sir George may arrive during the entertainment, because I have an idea it will mortify him, though I scarce know why I think so. Adieu. Yours, A. Fermor. Letter 53 to Miss Rivers, Clare Street, January 13, 11 o'clock. We passed a most agreeable evening with your brother, though a large company, which is seldom the case. A most admirable supper, excellent wine, an elegant dessert of preserved fruits, and everybody in spirits and good humour. The colonel was the soul of our entertainment, amongst his other virtues. He has the companionable and convivial ones, to an immense degree, which I never had an opportunity of discovering so clearly before. He seemed charmed beyond words to see us all so happy. We stayed till four o'clock in the morning, yet all complained to-day we came away too soon. I need not tell you we had fiddles, for there is no entertainment in Canada without them. Never was such a race of dancers. One o'clock. The dear man has come, and with an equipage which puts the Empress of Russia's trainue to shame. America never beheld anything so brilliant. All other carrioles at sight of this hide their diminished heads. Your brothers and Fitzgeralds will never dare to appear now. They sink into nothing. 7. In the evening. Emily has been in tears in her chamber. Tis a letter of Mrs. Malmus, which has had this agreeable effect. Some wise advice, I suppose. Lord, how I hate people that give advice. Don't you, Lucy? I don't like this lover's coming. He is almost as bad as a husband. I am afraid he will derange our little coterie, and we have been so happy I can't bear it. Good night, my dear. Yours, A. Fermor. Letter 54. To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, January 14. We have passed a mighty stupid day. Sir George is civil, attentive, and dull, Emily pensive, thoughtful, and silent, and my little self as peevish as an old maid. Nobody comes near us, not even your brother, because we are supposed to be settling preliminaries, 
for you must know sir george has graciously condescended to change his mind and will marry her if she pleases without waiting for his mother's letter which resolution he has communicated to twenty people at quebec in his way hither he is really extremely obliging i suppose the malmouths have spirited him up to this one o'clock emily is strangely reserved to me she avoids seeing me alone and when it happens talks of the weather papa is however in her confidence he is as strong an advocate for this milky baronet as mrs melmouth ten at night all is over lucy that is to say all is fixed they are to be married on monday next at the recollects church and to set up immediately for montreal my father has been telling me the whole plan of operations we go up with them stay a fortnight then all come down and show away till summer when the happy pair embark in their first ship for england emily is really what one would call a prudent pretty sort of woman i did not think it had been in her she is certainly right there is danger in delay she has a thousand proverbs on her side i thought what all her fine sentiments would come to she should at least have waited for mamma's consent this hurry is not quite consistent with that extreme delicacy on which she piques herself it looks exceedingly as if she was afraid of losing him i don't love her half so well as i did three days ago i hate discreet young ladies that marry and settle give me an agreeable fellow in a knapsack my poor rivers what will become of him when we are gone he has neglected everybody for us as she loves the pleasures of conversation she will be amazingly happy in her choice with such a companion to spend the long day he is to be sure a most entertaining creature adieu i have no patience yours a fermor after all i am a little droll i am angry with emily for concluding any advantageous match with a man she does not absolutely dislike which all good mammas say is sufficient and this only because it breaks in on a little circle of friends in whose society i have been happy oh self self i would have her hazard losing a fine fortune and a coach and six that i may continue my coachery two or three months longer adieu i will write again as soon as we are married my next will i suppose be from montreal i die to see your brother and my little fitzgerald this man gives me the vapours heavens lucy what a difference there is in men End of letters 49 through 54 end of the history of emily montague volume 1 by francis moore brook